Hello, welcome back to another movie vlog for Asian Cinema Season 2017. And this is kind of an on-the-day movie vlog. I'll be posting this the same day that I film it. Because today I put up my Akira Kurosawa in Color Marathon. Three and a half hour long video that took 11 hours to render. And then it failed at 82%, so... Had to delay it by a day, re-rendered all of it, took another 11 odd hours. Uploaded it today, which took a few hours, processed for a few hours, went live, a few people watched, I guess, 10, 20 minutes of it, and then it got taken down, blocked worldwide. So I need a video for today, and that's going to be... Uh, branded to Kill, which I unboxed a couple of weeks ago, I think. I, I, I bought a bunch of uh, Asian movies using one of my Amazon gift cards, and this was one of them that was really cheap and I decided to pick it up, a Seijin Suzuki film. And I said to people, what film out of this bunch would you want me to watch and talk about the most? And this by far got the most response, people saying I should check this out. I saw multiple people calling this a masterpiece, which I, you know, is probably not the best word to go into a movie with. But I'm going to check it out all the same. I have seen the, I, I believe this is uh, starring Joe Soshida, right? Certainly looks like it from the uh, the menu, anyway. Is his name anywhere on here? It isn't. Yeah, interview star Joe Shishido. Old uh, gerbil cheeks. So, I'm going to check this out. Yakuza movie, black and white, 60s, or 67, 1960. Yeah, 1967, there you go, bang on. So, branded to kill, go check it out and give my thoughts on it as I go through. Alright, I'm done and finished with Branded to Kill. Um, this was rated 18 uh, for containing scenes of uh, sexual violence and strong sex. It's very tame. It's very tame. I don't know if that 18 rating is applied more to the 1973 film Trapped in Lust, which is a delirious Roman porno reimagining of Branded to Kill. It might come from that. But the film itself, you're going to hate me guys, I didn't like it that much. Again, I've been hearing, not just from the, the Mail Day video where I showed this in the package I, I bought of the Asian films and this was the one people really talked about and said that's a masterpiece. Even before that I'd been hearing such great things about this. And my other experience with Sage and Suzuki, I think it is a Suzuki film, I'm not too sure, is Youth of the Beast. And if Youth of the Beast is a Suzuki film, it makes a lot of sense to me, because I, I liked that, but I didn't love it. It was kind of my, my least favorite massive cinema title I'd ever watched, and still is, I think, at, the, at this point. Uh, this, yeah, it was alright. Uh, so we have Joe Shishido playing uh, Hanada, a, a hitman. He's the number three hitman. I like that, that there was this kind of hierarchy, a top ten. And uh, the top, the number one was this elusive hitman that no one had ever met, and you know some of them between themselves discussed whether or not he even existed. And it follows him on a job at the beginning, and then he comes across this mysterious woman who hires him to do a job, and he fails to do the job, and because of that, he's now going to be hunted down by number one, and so he's a marked man basically. And I find it interesting how it's a 90-minute movie. The last half an hour is all about him. Uh, trying to not get killed by number one. So it's this this mind games session between Hanada and number one. And that was the most cohesive part of the film, and for the majority of it he is sleep deprived and even hallucinating to a point. And I just find it so funny that the main character is, you know, he's, he's had no sleep, he's seeing things, he's going crazy, and that was the most cohesive part of the film. It's very scattershot, it's very random. When uh, Nikatsu saw this film, they didn't want to release it, and so Suzuki fought them, took it to court, won the case, the film got released, and he was blacklisted for a number of years because of this. And I think it says on the back, uh, it's now rightly recognized as his masterpiece. 
Well, if this is his masterpiece, then I can safely say I'm not too excited to check out more of his other films. I still will, if the opportunity arises, and I don't regret watching this or even buying it. Uh, and I'll still keep it and maybe watch it again another, uh, another time. I think visually this film is really interesting. The cinematography is stunning, the way that he um, shot this film is incredible. I read that he edited it in one day, which just seems very unlikely to me. This film feels like it was thrown together completely, and at the same time it feels like it was meticulously planned out. It's a, it's a very weird one, you know. An absurdist masterpiece was a, a comment I saw on Wikipedia, I think. And the term masterpiece is one that gets thrown around quite a bit, and uh, I think pretty much everyone throws it around a bit too loosely, but regardless, uh, it was good. You know, it was good. I, I didn't like it very much, though. You know, uh, just very random. Uh, lots of weird moments that of unreality, which I suppose is the point, but it didn't feel too well thought out, ultimately. And th there's scenes where he'll have conversation with people who have stood 50 feet away from him, and there's no way that they could hear each other, and they're just speaking normally. Uh, again, it's a stylistic choice. Um, and, uh, hey, it's a different kind of film. I appreciate how different it was. I appreciate how the editing really keeps you on your toes and keeps the the story on its toes. And things very f move very fast and very quick, and there's a lot of cool visual devices Suzuki used to tell the story in a different kind of way, which I liked. But ultimately, the characters I didn't really care about at all. I didn't really feel any of the the threats for you know it just because everything was so unreal, I suppose, and that the main love interest was just such a dull, lifeless character who, yeah, she's pretty, but I mean I, I don't buy the character number three falling in love with her because well, unless it's purely lust, in which case it's it's he's fallen in lust and that's completely understandable, but she was just this, just dead, lifeless almost a corpse of a character, you know she's just there, and nothing was explained about her backstory, nothing was explained about why she was like that, and so ultimately I didn't really care too much, like there's a scene where you see her get tortured with flames and she's naked and it was I purely just, you know, was like, ooh, just because of the thought of it, not like, oh no, not that character, you know, I just, I guess that was part of it, you know, but it looked great, you know, with the black and white really helped the visuals as well, I think there's some really cool uses of uh, lighting with the, the shadows, just some fantastic shots in the film that, again, just play around with the shadows and light uh, of the dark lives that these characters lead. And my favorite part was probably the, the last half an hour where number one and number three are kind of in this weird battle between each other. Though even that felt a bit dragged out and a little bit nonsensical to me at times too. So, yeah, overall, disappointing for sure. Uh, I, I didn't love it. So, <laughs> there you go. That That's my, my brief kind of thoughts on Branded to Kill. Might disappoint some people, but I'm not writing it off at the same time, you know. Um, I feel like... You know, I'm giving it a chance if that makes sense. I feel like some people would watch this and would hate it for the reasons that I didn't like it, but I can at least see merit there. You know, I can see how it works for other people for sure. And you know, and there's some great kind of action set pieces too. The sequence on the dock was probably the best. I think I really liked how that played out and especially how it ended. You know, there's some great just sequences of him being this great hitman. But seeing him kind of slowly descend into, uh, you know, delirium uh, over his, you know, his nerves, his worries, his um, insecurities over the number one guy being after him. I liked how that sequence played out for the most part, especially when he's just so beside himself with, uh, uh, again, nervousness at this guy coming after him. There's a point where he's in this apartment and the camera pans around, he's on the floor with a noose around his neck and you think he's... Is he trying to kill himself, but he's kneeling on the floor, so what's he doing? You realize he's put a noose around his neck so that if he nods off, it kind of gets in his throat, so it wakes him up. He is so just exhausted of staying up and waiting for this guy to come after him that he just cannot stay awake, but he needs to keep himself awake. So that was good. And he has this weird fetish with smelling freshly cooked rice, which was something, <laughs> I guess. So yeah, Brad did the kill. Initial reactions... Not that impressed, but well, yeah, I was impressed by the visuals. I was impressed by the the audacity of how different it was, but not impressed as far as a film that was enjoyable to me. So there we go. That was my uh, my brief movie vlog on Branded to Kill. Thank you for watching. Leave your thoughts in it down below. Leave your thoughts on any other Sage and Suzuki films. If you'd like to recommend more, go ahead. Feel free. 
and I'll see you in the next one, which may or may not be the Kurosawa in Color Marathon. We'll see what happens with that. I've got no idea. YouTube seem intent on not having it go live, but I'll try and figure out a workaround. So bear with me, and hopefully I'll see you tomorrow in some kind of video. Hey, <laughs> Apart from the fact he throws cans of Carlin into a tree. <laughs> yeah, he's really cool. Yeah, he's really cool.